And it should appear on the screen in a moment when the video gets initialized by the kernel. Well, in fact, it's not the kernel, it's the script that resets the console by the looks of it. Now, um, I've had some problems getting LFS compiling and I've, I thought it was me to start off with but I'm thinking now it's this um, laptop that I'm on. Um, I've done some tests overnight on it and it appears to be okay at the moment so I'm trying not to touch it too much in case it is a problem um, where flexing the body or I have a feeling that some of the ports aren't connected properly like there's a a break in one of the contacts somewhere in some of the ports because the video was a bit flaky yesterday. Um, so yeah, we'll see how, see how it goes. If it fails again, I'm going to have to scratch this and um, uh, try something else. But yeah, here we are inside the Gen 2 Live USB. I'm going to change the keyboard so it matches the keyboard I'm using. Um, I've got an external, ordinary external keyboard plugged into the laptop because it's just nicer. The laptop's got these uh, chiclet style keyboards, which I think are probably one of the worst keyboards I've ever used. I, I really do hate them. Uh, they're quite horrible to use. Um, so I'm going to look for an English UK keyboard, uh, extended windows. So that matches the external keyboard. It probably wouldn't match the keyboard on the laptop. There'd probably be some sort of uh, other layout for it. Although it's a 17-inch screen, so it's got the bigger keyboard. It's um, uh, still uh, limited, obviously. So I'll apply that. Close that down. Uh, close that down, actually. What I need to do is to make sure that the screen saver and the lock screen doesn't come on. So I'm going to turn all that off. Screen locking. Turn that off. Apply it. And then I'm going to do. Uh, is it desktop? I think. Oops, desk. Yeah, display configuration. No, power, that's it, that's what I want. Power management. Right, so. When you're active, do nothing. That's okay. So I don't want that to dim, I don't want it to <coughs> turn off. Right, hopefully that is all I need. So, next thing I'm going to do is to get a browser up so that I can view the LFS manual. I'll just move this over here. And I'm going to split the screen into two. So, one half will have the LFS book and the other half will have the NFS manual. Now because I've got a bit of a ropey internet I'm going to actually use a local copy of the book so that's at HTTP 192.168.0.0 30 FS 12.3 12.3 in fact I'll load up the root of that oops right and the book is under here the reason why I've brought this up is because I've also got the packages already downloaded and checked um, again to well for speed and also 
um, in case the internet goes down. So it'll just be a little bit quicker and it saves the risk of um, potentially losing um, contact with the package. So I'm just going to increase the font size on that. And I'll do the same here. Now with the console, um, you can see the size appears just here. Make sure whatever size you select that the width, the first number is always greater than or equal to 80 because when we come to configure the kernel, uh, the script won't run if it finds the terminal's got fewer than 80 characters or alternatively, um, make it bigger and then just come back and reduce it. But 80 is probably a good figure to stick with. Um, anything bigger than 80. Next thing I'll do is become, oops, wrong window, become the root with sudo su minus. So I've got root access there now. And next thing I do, I suppose, is just start looking through the book now and prepare. So, um, yeah, regarding the book, there's two parts, I guess, you should really read. In fact, everything in part one and part two, so that's chapters one, two, three, and four, I'd read um, thoroughly. I normally recommend reading the book. If you've never done Linux from scratch before, go through and read the book, either print it out or read it on the screen, um, just to get a feel for how the book is laid out and how the process for building Linux from scratch works. Um, if you're a bit familiar with it, then uh, when you come to do it and also watching the videos, it'll just seem uh, to make a bit more sense. Um, and if you don't do that, at least read parts one and two, so chapters one, two, three, and four, because um, they've got key information about setting up Linux from, from scratch and getting, getting going with it. Um, the rest of the book up to chapter 10, I think it is, or chapter 11, is concerned with obviously building and finishing off the installation. And then the appendices has got some useful information, especially these scripts that can be quite interesting to read, see how they work. So, um, yeah, let's carry on. And we've got to start with forward, so it gives some sort of background to the project, how it came about, who uh, the intended audience is. Target architectures, um, it's targeted at 32 bit and 64 bit Intel stroke AMD CPUs, um, but it will work with modifications and other architectures. So it says power PCs and ARM CPUs. I have actually built it on a unpowered Raspberry Pi before and yes it did need some tweaks but it, it did work um, might be something I'll re revisit soon soon because I haven't um, touched that for a number of years now uh, get some times and sizes for uh, quite an old version of Linux from scratch that's probably from maybe five years ago and also the CPU is quite an old one despite the fact it's a high end one it's quite an old one um, so my guess would be that these figures probably wouldn't, well certainly the build time probably wouldn't change much um, because although processors are faster, um, there's more bloat if you like in Linux from scratch, there's more packages, packages tend to become bigger, certainly G things like GCC have got a lot bigger even in the last few years. So I would guess that on the latest CPU that these these build times probably wouldn't be a lot different to that build size well as I say things tend to get bigger over time so I imagine that would be a little bit bigger I have a feeling yeah I can't really remember any sizes that I've seen recently of how big the installation is but it's making a point here about how the 64-bit build is only 3% faster to build that is um, but it's 22% larger but Bear in mind, 32-bit seems to be on the wane quite a lot now. There's a lot of distributions aren't supporting 32-bit. I'd say that's probably a bit of a moot point now. Um, you'd only be building 32-bit uh, for specific regions. Um, maybe you want to use an old uh, Pentium 
uh, MMX or something for a server or something like that, or a Pentium Pro or something, or even a Pentium 2 or 3, I think, as 32 bit as well. So, um, you know, they're probably, what would they be about? 20 years old, those sort of processors. So, um, yes, you can still build it, and it's good that you can still build it, but um, it is on the way. And in fact, there's been talk about 486 processors being dropped from kernel, uh, kernel support. And I would suggest that if that happened, it's possibly likely that i586 would be dropped as well and just leaving i686, i.e. Pentium Pro is the minimum CPU that's supported by the kernel, but we'll wait to see about that. From what I can remember reading, 486 is almost certainly going to be dropped when we move on to the version 7 of the kernel. So currently, um, they're probably still supported, but um, certainly it's going to be dropped. So it's just eating into that um, installation base of 32-bit um, which don't don't think about 32-bit as being just desktops or laptops. There's millions of embedded systems, whether they be industrial machines such as knitting machines, maybe or CNC machines that will be using um, old technology, um, but still using and still working uh, because it's not um, financially viable to upgrade or technically viable to upgrade um, so it's it's something that won't go away that quickly but it is going away slowly anyway I digress there somewhat so prerequisites there's some information here about what you need to have personally in terms of skill and knowledge and there's some links here about um, building software and building from source and so on so you do need to know a little bit about the Linux command line. It, it would help. Um, I I actually used Linux from scratch as a way to force myself to learn Linux. I had um, had done some learning prior to it, but I had no reason to use that learning. And Linux from scratch was a way to practice that learning. And also it taught me um, some good little tricks on the command line, which I probably might not have learned otherwise. Um, standards, so Linux and Scratch tries to stick to these three standards and it lists here which standards apply to which parts of the LFS system. This page is quite good because it lists the reasons or the rationales behind selecting specific packages. Um, you may think sometimes, oh, I don't think that should be in there, that's unnecessary, or why have they used this package instead of this equivalent package well it gives the reasons for this here uh, and obviously I would, I would suggest that most of these packages are mandatory because the dependencies required by other core packages that you couldn't do without so that that could be quite useful if you start scratching red as to why are certain packages in the book typography um, so this shows how the different fonts and layouts in the book convey uh, semantics I guess convey meaning about what you should do whether this is information or whether it's something you should type into the terminal um, so that's worth reading and understanding structure of the book so there's several parts five parts of the book and as you can see we're in the introduction at the moment when we move on to actually starting work on the system we'll be in part two preparing for the build Part three involves preparing the um, environment for building the final system. So we will start building software in part three, but it's only a temporary system that's used for the uh, building the final system. Final system is built in part four, and part five is all the appendices. Errata and security advisories, where I think I've already shown you that on the actual web page where that is. Uh, so there's more information there and some direct links from the book. So let's move into part one introduction how to build an LFS system. 
So it gives you a bit more details about each individual chapters and what each individual chapter does. Again, I suggest you read this. Um, I don't see there's any point in me going over or reading what's on the screen. It's uh, probably a bit pointless, that is. What's new since the last release? So these are all the packages that have been upgraded. There's no new packages and there's no packages that have been retired from the book. Change log, so these are all the fixes, uh, mainly they're updates, there may be the occasional bug in there that's been found or um, tweak or something. Resources, so there's an FAQ, if you've got a question, check it that it's not in the FAQ first of all, rather than repeating questions that have been commonly repeated before. There's a couple of mailing lists you can ask questions, which you need to sign up to. There's a relay chat, internet relay chat. And there's mirror sites for downloading the book and packages, which may be a bit easier to use. And contact, please direct all your questions and comments to one of the LFS mailing lists, see above. Um, help, so this gives you some links for gaining help. Um, if you do ask a question on my channel, although I'm, I'm unfortunately spending less time responding to comments, I do read them. Um, you can ask questions and I will do my best to answer um, if I can. Uh, otherwise, uh, there's these links here. I, I normally suggest to go to the Linux and Scratch people first because they're, they're the owners of the project, basically. Um, I'm just a third party who's doing these videos um, for no other reason other than for my own gratification and to fill my time up with doing something useful um, otherwise you can search the internet just do a search on your favorite search engine uh, it may be that somebody else has come across a similar problem either within Linux from scratch or if it's a more of a generic bug with the package uh, there's a chance that somebody else has come across it some uh, in some other situation um, things to mention this is important here you need to give some background as to what you're doing what commands you're running and also, importantly, what area you're getting. And as it says here, don't just include the last line um, or the first error message. It's meaningless. You need to include the information beforehand to give some context as to what command failed. Um, and this is quite a good document. I think I've read it before um, about how to ask questions in a way that will elicit a good answer. So basically a good question will give you a good answer. 